can have all this world you can have all this world but give me Jesus told me. Hello everybody and welcome to all of those on live stream. Tonight's going to be a very, very interesting, well at least it was to me, if we don't get too buried in technical terms, but it should be an interesting um, glance at what is developing and building around us and what will impact our lives probably very strongly in terms of convenience for a while, then it might become more intrusive and in, uh, imposing in the days ahead, but we want to make sure that as we look at it, we also consider things from a biblical perspective as to how should we react to all of it. So let's have a word of prayer, then we'll begin our talk on advanced technologies, potential threat to freedom. And I won't give any details, but pray for Joe Calise having some health challenges related to COVID and um, a very difficult time he's having. Please pray for Joe and for Shannon Mulford, who was recovering from surgery that he had on his ear. Uh, it was a cancerous growth, and he sent me a picture today, and they removed about half of his ear. Uh, and they took some biopsies from some lymph nodes in his neck and shoulder, and he should have the results of that here pretty soon. His son was the missionary who was here with the pink jacket on a few weeks ago. That was Shannon's son. Shannon was a teenager, grew up here in the church. He is now in the ministry in uh, Springfield, Missouri, and his son is going to Portugal as a missionary. But pray for Shannon and for Michelle Miller, who is recovering from hip surgery, and uh, George Beck with COVID, and then Joe Calise with COVID too. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have the privilege to meet together tonight, and we don't take for granted that we can do so freely without any uh, government interference or hindrances or really any social occurrence of a negative nature. And Help us to take advantage of that for as long as we can, and maybe it will be for years we'll have this kind of freedom, or um, things could dissolve quickly. We trust that you will guide us, lead us, work through us to be salt and light in the culture in which we live. Help us to be consistent. Help us to be kind, loving, aware, with our eyes fully open to be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves, that we can represent you. And we ask you to bless this discussion tonight in Jesus' name, amen. Now just for a little teaser, next Wednesday night, 
we're going to hear about artificial intelligence. And I've asked my nephew to make the presentation. He has developed a couple of um, internet Bible study, Christian discussion things using all artificial intelligence. And it's just so fascinating what artificial intelligence has done with the information that he has fed into it. And it'll be a good example of some of the good that can come from artificial intelligence. And also we're going to talk about some of the uh, pending dangers. And then this Sunday, after church, we're going to be discussing the implications and the applications in our lives of the UFO, UAP phenomena and what it means to us as believers. Should it affect our faith? How could it possibly affect our faith? How should we respond to it? And at the end, I'll give you my personal opinion of what I think is really taking place. And I'll just give you a little hint. There's a suggestion as to what is taking place in the change in terminology in the last six months. The things that are now being referred to very differently than even six months ago, I think gives you a hint of some things. We'll talk about that Sunday after church. And so next Wednesday night, we'll conclude the technology look. And we'll get back to more just basic practical things. But the technology world that we're talking about is not just being invented as we speak. This has been building and growing for decades, and it's coming to a point where it's expanding so rapidly that whatever you and I see is probably obsolete by the time we see it. It certainly has been already developed by the federal government by the time commercial and consumers are aware of it. But it's, it's coming fast. It is unstoppable. It's inevitable. It might be slowed down. But certainly, probably in our lifetime, we will see most of these things integrated into everyday life. A couple of things I'd like to look at. This is from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. <clears throat> they issued a statement last year. Technological developments carry very significant risks for human dignity, autonomy, privacy, and the exercise of human rights in general, if not managed with great care. That statement coming from the UN in itself is paradoxical. Uh, this is an organization that is heavily promoting the absence or the loss of individual freedom, yet they, they are indicating they see some concerns. <clears throat> uh, Revelation 13, 16, 18, He, the Antichrist, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. It is the number of a man. His number is 666. That is both Christian prophetic, um, exciting language, and it is scientific uh, exciting language. It has been probably since the 60s. This has fascinated the theological world and the science fiction world as to what that is, and is it possible, is it likely, is it feasible, or is it fantasy? Well, now all of us know this is not only just some far away mythical threat, this is real life today. This could be accomplished within six months from now. This is a reality we could literally face without necessarily the Antichrist even being involved. So when the Bible talks prophetically about things that will happen in the end times, it doesn't necessarily say that those things, once they appear, the end times start. It means that they're there in the end times. They could develop long before the end times are unleashed. So we believe in the, or at least I teach, the rapture. And after the rapture of the church, there's a seven-year period called the Great Tribulation that culminates with the return of Christ. There are a lot of things that are characteristic of those seven years that could be characteristic of the years leading up to it. Uh, there's no, it doesn't mean that once this happens, we are in the seven-year tribulation. And you can look at that by looking at Russia, China, Nazi Germany, any place where a dictatorship has taken over free people and imposed their will on them. Those cultures look a lot like the stories in Revelation, um, the later chapters. It looks a great deal like it. So for those people, they would say, we're living in the end times, but we're in America. We haven't experienced that kind of oppression yet, but we could also lose our freedoms in the United States long before the Antichrist ever comes. 
But eventually that all has to happen. 1 John 2, 18 and 4, 3. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour, the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. That was written almost 2,000 years ago. So this is not a far-off projection. The way I assess it, we know that we are 2,000 years closer to fulfilling the book of Revelation than we were when John wrote it. So however you look at it in terms of time frame, we've moved a long ways. Maybe it is 1,000 years off from now. Maybe it's 100. Maybe it's 50. Maybe it's closer than any of us would even imagine. But just keep that in mind as we talk about these things because I think it helps us understand what part they will play. Technological tools that increase convenience but decrease privacy. Universal Basic Income, UBI, is one of the things being touted by a number of organizations and entities and governments that it would be fair, it would be equitable for there to be a basic universal income. A presidential candidate, candidate uh, at the last election uh, promoted that for a while until he just was obliterated out of the possibility of winning, and we didn't hear any more about it. But he was touting that four years ago of having a universal basic income well, that sounds wonderful, but it means there's somebody controlling what that income is. And so it has some aspects of control to it. Uh, CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, um, OpenAI, LinkedIn, and a major venture, venture capital firm um, have back a plan by a group called WorldCoin. And you've probably heard about it. It's been in the news at least the last three or four weeks. And this idea of WorldCoin combines three concepts, cryptocurrency, universal basic income, and biometric scanning. And so to make all those three things come together, they have now in a few major cities um, set up these globe-looking or spheres uh, eye scanners. And if you will come and have your eye scanned, they will then give you some cryptocurrency to make it worth your while and to entice you to do it so they can begin to collect scans of irises as the means through which you would access everything that you have and own and want to move and sell and buy and accrue. It all be done through your iris and people lined up down the block in all these places to get their eyes scanned so that all of a sudden their access to money and everything is as simple as I just walk in and get a scan, and I can pay for anything, have everything. And it does sound very convenient, but you're giving up something. Just like everybody here probably has a cell phone. It is incredibly convenient, almost essential to everyday life now, but it means everybody, whoever wants to know, knows where we are at all times. Uh, and the suggestion is it can also take pictures and listen into conversations with the camera and the mic that we're carrying around with us, a recording device. And if somebody wanted to record what we're saying or doing, they could. We have surrendered privacy for the sake of convenience. We've done that, you know, for decades, but we're doing it in so many different fronts now. You and I have probably surrendered most of our privacy and don't even know it. If you have a personal computer and a, and a phone, you already have been compromised, but no one's taken advantage of it yet, unless it's a hacker or a scammer, but the government hasn't taken advantage of it yet, unless what William Snowden said is true, then yes, they, they, they did. Um, RFID, uh, radio frequency identification. The RFID, uh, RFID chips that can be embedded underneath the skin that we heard about for years, they're now fairly small. The process is, is inexpensive, and that provides a digital interface with the real world and it can hold your identity, your credit card information, your bus pass, your library card, your passport. Everything about you can be on your body, underneath your skin, where you can't lose it. And supposedly it's highly encrypted and cannot be accessed by anybody but an authorized government machine. But they've said that about pretty much everything that we get, that it's secure. And there's always smart people who know how to not do that. But the concern is not criminality. It's that the government can access it. And that's part of our life right now. The NFC, near field communication, 
which is, uh, you, you've done it now, your, your debit card, if you go to a place and all you got to do is tap your card or wave it past something, that's near field communication. That means you don't even have to put your card in, you just have to wave it over. That's a technology that's going to go along with the RFID chips and any other device they come up with that all you have to do is just sort of wave your hand over it and you've paid for it. Uh, as Melissa was telling me her experience today at, at Whole Foods, there's places that are doing something very similar to that now. GDP, Global Digital Passport, which is what the UN is, is initiating in some 30 or 40 countries right now, a passport that is completely on an RFID chip, but it's a, everything about you was on it, and it allows you to go from country to country and all your medical records are on it, and your vaccine records, so it allows them to keep out the unvaccinated people or those who have had the vaccines they're supposed to have can come in. It's another control device. GPS, Global Positioning Satellite. For some of us, it's in our cars. It's on our cell phones. If you use your map finder on your cell phone and you see your little car driving down the road, well, there I am on the highway right there. That's the Global Positioning Satellite. That's what makes it so easy for us to get around. Your young people, most of them under the age of 18, don't even know what a map is. They've never had to open up a map because that's so convenient. And they're being trained to look at it that way, never even wondering, well, if, if somebody somewhere knows exactly where I am right now, what can be done with that information? We don't question it because we don't live in a communist country. We've never been monitored like that. We don't see the danger but I think it is one. Artificial intelligence, we'll get to that next week. Surveillance on street cameras, drones, your iPhone, your Android, Alexa, and Siri. The other day, I, uh, my brother-in-law sent me a, a little video clip, and it was somebody talking to a Alexa. And it said, Alexa, who won the 2024 election? Of course, which hasn't happened yet. And so Alexa, on this video, is going to answer the question. Well, as it plays, Alexa, who won the 2024 election? My Alexa in the kitchen answered the question. It was listening. I thought we had that thing unplugged. A long time ago, I thought it was. It heard, and it started answering the question. And I looked over there and thought, well, how did that hear the question off my phone, off a video? We don't even know how we're being monitored. That's from just your phone. Smart TVs and laptops. The camera is flippable without you being notified. The older devices, they have a, a light that will tell you when your camera is being utilized, but the new ones don't, uh, on your TV at home and on your laptop. Weaponry, uh, drones as being weapons, directed energy weapons, which you've probably heard a lot about in Maui, but they existed long before this Maui thing, and laws, lethal autonomous weapon systems, which are like little robots, the dogs, and the little machines that actually are weaponized, they're, they're automated, they're autonomous. They don't need somebody to be controlling them. They walk around on their own. And, well, all of those are threats to human dignity and privacy. If an autonomous, automated machine can walk up to you and threaten you with a weapon. Those things are not science fiction. They're being used right now. The directed energy weapons, the laws, and the drones are all different ways that somebody is accruing ability to control large groups and being done even without human interaction. So you can't argue with a robot. You can't argue with a drone. You can't argue with a mechanical device. Uh, you can't argue with artificial intelligence. You can't get sympathy. You can't get... Um, judgment and discernment. It, it's going to be black and white. And uh, it's been in some science fiction movies and uh, it always, they always take it as far as they possibly can for the thrill's sake. But that's not so far off. It used to be, but it's not anymore. This is from the World Economic Forum. Not a, f a fan of individual freedom. Not a friend of Christianity by any means. It's an arm or at least a companion with the UN. This is from an article they wrote, what new technologies carry the biggest risks for individual freedom and privacy? 
according to the right to privacy in the digital age, that was an article, it was a UEF report, data-intensive technologies bring unprecedented challenges to the right to privacy, including the worrisome growth of individual digital footprints of billions of people collected through personal computers, smartphones, smartwatches, and fitness trackers. We literally are carrying with us every day little strings that are connected to something, and that something is collecting that information. 3D printing, that's the synthesis of physical objects, and then 3D bioprinting of synthetic tissues and organs. So this thing we heard about 10 years ago that they were first starting to show you and they'd make these plastic things that was 3D print. They can 3D print fully functional, not only mechanical things, but tissues and organs. Now, I, it's a technology I don't understand. I've seen it, I've, and videos I've seen them do it. I think that's an amazing thing. But they have gone so far from what they were showing us five years ago, even the World Economic Forum said that's a big threat. And if they've considered it a threat, and they're open to the idea of a one world government, you and I certainly should consider it a threat. Advanced materials and nanomaterials. Uh, they're developing thermoelectric properties, shape retention, that means a, a solid like a piece of metal that can sort of melt and go through something and then reshape, which is right out of science fiction. They, now, they can't do it in full but they can do it in small pieces where a piece of metal can go through some bars and then reassemble. That technology is going to take us somewhere. And they have, these materials have different functions than the natural materials that we have had. We don't know what those mean or what they're going to do with those. Artificial intelligence and robotics, machines substituted for human tasks, uh, thinking and multitasking and fine motor skills. A lot of surgeries are now done through robotics, and it's much better than having a human do it. And the Florida Bioethics Network, we, we met this last week. It's uh, doctors and philosophers and surgeons all across the state, and uh, I'm on the advisory board. We have been discussing the last few meetings, um, chat about GBT and, and GPT and artificial intelligence and diagnosis and prognosis and then treatment, all done without a human being being there. Uh, and that it's more reliable, 99% more reliable than a human diagnosis. Well, what will happen when our medical field just surrenders over to artificial intelligence? And you become a statistical thing rather than an individual with a particular problem that maybe you might be the one this would work with. That'll be pushed out. Wait, no, you're in the 1% category. We're done. Next. It'll be very cold and it'll be very efficient and logical not human, uh, biotechnologies, uh, gen genome editing, <clears throat> gene therapies, we've been doing that for years, genetic manipulation, and synthetic biology, all that goes along with cloning, which is illegal around the world, but being done all over the world to some degree and to some level of success. The man who was involved with um, cloning Dolly the sheep, you know, just died last week. That was a long time ago, you think about it. It was in the 90s when Dolly the sheep was cloned. We didn't stop there. That, it's not like the moon landing. We went there and then we don't go anymore. The cloning, that was just step one. We don't even know where they are in the cloning technology. Energy capture, storage, and transmission. This is an, a fascinating one. Advanced batteries and fuel cells, something called orbiting solar arrays, Tidal energy capture, smart grid systems, and wireless energy transfer. All those sound fantastic. They're not fossil fuel, but they all involve government controlling of it. So once we can get off gasoline that you can go down to the store and buy, once we can get off oil, and everything becomes some new system of energy that is clean and provided by the government, that also means it can be stopped by the government. And that's when you realize, oh, I gave up my individual freedom and my access because I just can't go out and buy this now. It has to be provided for me. Although it's clean and it's cheap and maybe even free, I can't get it if I don't fall in line with whoever is controlling that. 
That's the danger of that one. Now, these are all the things identified by the World Economic Forum. This is not some um, conspiracy website. Blockchain and distributed ledger. Cryptographic systems that manage, verify, and publicly record transaction data. And w whether or not you ever do anything with blockchain, everything that we do that ever involves a purchase on the Internet or a debit cards or any electronic transaction, it's all being loaded up somewhere. It's all being recorded somewhere. And it's going to be used to change the money system at some point where you won't be able to buy or sell anything without it being part of this flow being controlled through a blockchain and distributive ledger and might even change the very nature of money. Geoengineering, technological intervention to mitigate the effects of climate change by removing carbon dioxide or managing solar radiation. This was, uh, remember when Hurricane, um, the one that hit New Orleans, I forgot the name of it. Yeah, Katrina. When Katrina came and they blamed it on George Bush and everybody laughed and yeah, we all laughed. At, How can a president make a hur director hurricane? Well, you find on the news now they're talking about weather-inducing technology now. And that would go along with geoengineering. To mitigate climate change, we'll make something happen over here. And the removal of carbon dioxide to clean the air, we don't know what that does to our system. And then managing solar radiation. Those are technologies that will involve a radical change somehow in our life and the implementation of machinery that you and I are unaware even exists. This is another interesting thing, the Internet of Things, network sensors that will remotely connect product, products, systems, and grids. That means the physical world. Like we all have the Internet on our um, computer. I know what that means. You can access anybody in any country. You can talk anywhere in the world. You can get information from anywhere, like an infinite degree of it. They're talking about the likelihood and the inevitability of connecting everything that's man-made and produced being connected um, in a way that things can be fixed remotely, things can be controlled remotely, and things can be shut off remotely. Let's say somebody is chasing you and you packed your family in your car and you're trying to get to Colorado and all of a sudden your car, it's part of the Internet of Things that can be shut down which helps stop crime. It helps uh, monitor terrorists. But to monitor a terrorist, you've got to monitor the people who are hanging around in the general area as well. Uh, I think it's very dangerous. The Internet of Bodies, network biometric chips and nanobots implanted in bodies. You know, if we went down all of these and we didn't know this was the World Economic Forum, we would say this is off somebody's crazy conspiracy website that all these things can be taking place at the same time. But the plan is that in an industrialized country, everybody would have a biomedical chip in them that would allow them to be connected to all other people. To the point, enhanced thinking, enhanced brain work, enhanced eyesight that Elon Musk has been talking about, that our bodies can become um, a hybrid of electronics and digital capacity and computers integrated into our brain, uh, or even our physicalities can be enhanced through uh, whatever is embedded in our muscles to make them act differently. But anything put in you would then be connected with something put in somebody else. So let's say, or a funny one, there's two football teams playing, and you want this team to score. <laughs> Just shut down the biochemical device and these guys, they fall down, these guys score, they will be able to do what they do with drones. It's the same, those beautiful things you've seen of drones doing the dancing in the skies at the Olympics, that's all biometrically connected in terms of what it would do for us. Humans could be moved in the same way, not as smoothly, of course, but that's the idea. Neurotechnology, smart drugs, neuroimaging, uh, that's all talk about in the brain, Bioelectronic interfaces to influence brain activity, to enhance thinking, to direct thinking, 
to excel, learn, uh, accelerate learning, and whatever else that could be done with. New computing technologies, quantum computing, which some of you here might understand what that is. I've, I've had it explained a number of times, and I still don't quite understand it. Centralized cloud computing, where the great cloud that we all send our stuff up to, that there is a, uh, an internet in the sky that everybody can access. Uh, neural network processing, using your brain, not having to use your keyboard, using your thoughts. Biological data storage and optical computing, that's using your eyes, your brain, without having to use hands, where the screen is not even a physical screen, but a projected screen. I was in a car the other day that uh, I'd never seen before, maybe you've seen them, but the speedometer, the speed, looked like it was dancing on the hood of the car. It's a reflection on the glass, on the windshield. But when you're in the driver's seat, it said 60 miles an hour, and it was sitting on the hood of the car. So as you're driving, you see a 3D figure on the hood of your car. And so, but over here, you can't see it. You have to be in the driver's seat. And it's a projection on the windshield done in such a way, it gives, it's like a hologram. And it was a, a car purchased here in the United States, and not even that expensive of a car. We don't know where they're going with all that kind of thing, but our, our, the new computing technologies are just light years ahead of what you and I are familiar with. Space technologies, micro satellites, very, very small ones, reusable rockets and integrated rocket jet engines, which is something we, what we don't have in practice, but they do exist and they are being um, worked on. Space is going to change entirely as to our interaction with it, our access to it, and how comfortable we get with it. Virtual and augmented realities, that's immersive environments in which the, whether it's a hologram or it is a, 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 a visual eyepiece you're wearing that makes your brain think it is inside a world, but being immersed in a visual world. I was in one, I think I told you this a few months ago, but it was a Christmas gift somebody in my family got, and you just put on these little goggles, and you interacted with this 3D world. It was so realistic. I, I was, like, paralyzed. In the video, I'm on top of a 55-story building out on a ledge, and I knew I'm standing in my father-in-law's living room. I knew I was there on the carpet. But in my brain, I was standing on a two-foot-wide plank out of a 55-story building looking down on the street, and I just was frozen. My body believed it. My brain believed it. And so, in, in the video, as I'm watching it, I'm looking down like this, and somebody touched me on the back, and it about sent me into, I felt like somebody was pushing me off the ledge. All I had to do was step, and I would have been on the, I, I knew where I was, but my brain was totally, that's an immersive environment. That was five or six years ago in a $100 video game. The immersive environments are going to be so immersive and completely realistic it's going to make it difficult for some people to even function in the real world. That'll be so much more pleasant and possibly even greatly enhance all sorts of experiences and learning, um, uh, even operating things might be in that kind of immersive environment. Uh, so the benefits and conveniences of new technologies and advancements in current technologies will be touted as those technologies are revealed and presented. I mean, the benefits we're going to hear all about but the associated dangers or threats will be minimalized or concealed. Now, this list I'm about to give you, this came from the World Economic Forum report. This didn't come off anybody's conspiracy website. It's off the UN's. Here's the benefits. Identification will be easier. Exchanging foreign money will be unnecessary because you just travel with the same digital currency. ATM activity will be easier. You don't have to have a card. You just walk up, look down at the machine, or wave your hand. Uh, misidentification will be eliminated because there won't be any mistakes in who's who anymore, whether it's a senior adult who's lost or a baby in the hospital. Children and elders will be safer. You'll always know where they are. Health information will be more accessible and reliable. You don't have to wait a week for it to be transferred to your doctor or make sure he gets the right thing or something got lost. It's all on your body at all times. 
Money will be less accessible to thieves and less likely to be lost. Unless somebody cuts your hand off, then I may be. Uh, tracking criminals will be more effective. Firearms will be more controllable because they will have those same devices in, in the Internet of Things. Those are the benefits the WEF touted. Now, here are the dangers they put down at the bottom of the article. All your personal information is retrievable. Oh, I'm sorry, I worded these. These are mine from what they said. All your personal information is retrievable by an outside authority. It's fine if the outside authority is your friend. Your exact location can be quickly identified by an outside authority. All your funds can be controlled by the regional central bank. And we saw what um, Prime Minister Trudeau tried to do in Canada. It was that very same thing. What you purchase will be monitored and be controlled by an outside authority. Where you make your purchases will be monitored and can be controlled by an outside authority. Your travel will be monitored and be controlled by an outside authority. They can say your particular bio chip or your scan of your eye that's only authorized within a 35 mile diameter of your house. That means you can't travel anywhere. Because outside of that circle, you can't buy any more supplies. To function, you have to get back into your circle. They can centralize what you can even access. Supposedly, you can access the entire world, but they can also uh, localize it. Um, all your communications will be accessible to an outside authority. Your electrical power can be cut off by an outside authority. We saw in the uh, fires in Maui the terrible damage of the water company not being able to make water accessible. <laughs> Uh, the alarms, for some reason, not working, and it allowed a tragedy to happen. And I'm not saying it was intentional, but you see the result of something not being made available. What if the authority somehow designates you as a contrarian civilian and they just shut your power off in your house? How long are you going to survive with no electricity um, to refrigerate your food or to cool your house or to run your phone or your computer once their batteries go dead? That's a very like, likely outcome. Your vehicle, your firearms, your phone, and your computer can be deactivated by an outside authority. Now, those are my wordings of what I got from their list of dangers. So, the Internet, X or Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, Livestream, Zoom, and a myriad of the other social platforms have created a virtual replacement for in-person fellowship. And that by, by, I don't mean Christian fellowship. I mean just interaction with humans. As technology increases its presence and the influence in our daily lives, it is critical that we remember these biblical admonitions to stay connected to each other so we can effectively encourage and edify each other. And for those watching on live stream, I'm going to have time for questions, so I'll just read you the references. John 13, 34, 35 is the command for us to love one another. Colossians 2, 1 through 3 is about the great being knitted together and bonded together we have in Christ. 1 Thess Thessalonians 5, 8 through 11 talks about us comforting and edifying one another. Ephesians 4, 11, the great connection of the church that we are to be built up and that we've all been equipped to feed the body so that it grows. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, that after this great talk about the rapture and Christ coming back, we are to comfort one another with these words. This technology coming, most of us here, I would assume all of us, probably have very little impact or effect we can have on whether this happens or not, other than the way we might vote, and anymore, you never know. Somebody tells you they're going to do something when they get to D.C., and when they get there, for some reason, they don't do it. So you hope your vote counts, but you just never seem to know. And then this is like a, it's a, it's a huge tsunami that's being held, like Moses with the split river, it doesn't matter who's the president, who's Congress. They can only hold it back so long. It's coming. Knowing that, if it comes in our lifetimes, what is our coping mechanism? Well, of course, it's our faith and it's prayer, but it's also one another. Finding the ways to interact and fellowship and encourage other believers and start building that network now so that it's there when somebody shuts it all down and all of a sudden... We're not allowed to meet in church. 
Well, they can never tell us we can't meet in church, but they just did three years ago. Every, our church shut down, what, for eight weeks? And we got back a little early, but we shut down for eight weeks. We had an Easter service with nobody here. It was just me in the pulpit and me standing outside live streaming by myself because we couldn't gather. That, that was unheard of. But now we've all experienced it. Well, the second time's not as hard. Third time's even easier. After a while, it becomes normal. We have some people, and this is not to in any way disparage their character, but we have people in our church who've never really come back to church, but they do watch faithfully on live stream. And I'm glad we have live stream. There are some people who can't really get out much, and it's a great blessing to them. But even, you can see how even we have replaced in-person fellowship with virtual uh, fellowship. And it's a blessing to those who can't do the other, but it can easily become a replacement for real human contact of touch and feel and handshake and hug and eye-to-eye -eye contact. Uh, we can easily replace that, and it could happen before we even realize we did it. And I think we need to make a, a diligent effort to remain humanly and physically connected to each other as our spiritual responsibility as our world becomes far more technological and far more technical and far more sterile and far more separated. We saw the damage that COVID did in the development of our children and in the mental health world of how many psychological problems developed because of the isolation of not being able to interact. And some of you had horrible experiences in the hospital because you couldn't see your loved one because we were forbidden to interact. Uh, we, uh, the church lost an entire two-year generation from not being able to assemble together. And the assembling together is a lot of what binds us. I think we need to reemphasize that. Even if it's for silly reasons to get together, just to get together, to, to love on each other and, and talk to each other and encourage each other and edify each other and connect. So when you're all by yourself and everything has gone haywire, you know there are some people who genuinely love you and know you, and will think of you in prayer. And then when you come across them, there'll be an immediate edification uh, and hope. I'll close with this, but years ago, in one of the um, first times, a few times I got arrested for uh, the abortion issue, it was in a jail in New York City. And there was quite a few of us uh, who were there, and um, they separated us all. They put us all in different places, and it seemed to be a multi-level institution where we were in this maze of... They were sending us from cell to cell so that we couldn't really um, have a network of communication or whatever. And I remember they were marching some of us down this narrow alleyway. And as we came through, there was this big glass opening. And I remember I turned and across the hallway, about where Gus is right now on that side, they were moving some people that way. And there was somebody from my group who was there. And we caught eyes and went, <gasps> And I remember I, I went like that with my hand and I waved like, there, there you are. And he did the same. And later when we got back together, we talked about how both of us were tangibly affected by that connection across a way while we were suffering. Just the human connection is something, sometimes it's all that will really hold you together. As strong as you might think you are, we need each other. And I would encourage us in the face of technology to become more human, to become more personal and to get more connected uh, with other believers because I think the day's coming when we're going to need it. And maybe it won't be in our lifetime, but it is coming. And at least we can set the pattern for our children and grandchildren that they need each other and they need fellowship. Let's pray, then we'll shut off the live stream and we'll take some questions. Heavenly Father, we thank you that there's nothing that we've talked about tonight that surprises you or that you were not in control of. And even the schemes and plans and intentions of evil people is under your complete sovereign control. And things will unfold as you know they will. There's not a time that you're waiting to see when you're going to send your son back. You know exactly when Jesus is returning. We ask you to help us to have that faith uh, entrenched in our souls so we never waver, we never doubt, and we don't fear, and we don't panic, but we stand strong even in the midst of a whirlwind around us. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for those on live stream. Thank you for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you Sunday as we begin our study on the Ten Commandments. For those of you who are here, by the way, for the question time, don't feel obligated to stay. If you have to leave, please feel free to go.